Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 Podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp here with Blake Alderman. Blake, uh, we uh, are getting pretty good at predicting when news is going to drop. It seems like all we have to do is release an episode of the Swamp 24-7 Podcast at noon on a Sunday, and Dan Mullen gets fired, Billy Napier gets hired. Two weeks in a row, we've nailed it. So uh, I guess let's talk about Billy Napier, Blake. You know, we, we did a lot of reporting on him being obviously the top guy for Florida really throughout this process, which happened pretty quickly. I want to get your initial thoughts on, one, how quickly this process was wrapped up and, and how Scott Strickland kind of attacked this thing, uh, and then just generally on on what Florida fans can expect to get with Billy Napier. You know, I think, you know, a lot of kudos to Scott Strickland, um, you know, really identified his guy quickly. Um, you know, there's always kind of, a, you know, the crazy season whenever coaching, you know, the coaching carousel starts cranking up. Um, you know, it, it seems like he definitely <clears throat> really kind of identified his guy well before Dan Mullen was let go at Florida. Um, and I think that was probably a luxury for him to get this deal done as fast as it did. Um, and, you know, and, and, and kind of hindsight with that, you know, Lincoln Riley goes to USC. There were the rumors to LSU. It seemed like LSU was kind of, uh, you know, kind of big game hunting with their coaching hire. Um, didn't really seem like they were um, really focusing a lot on Napier. So I think now in hindsight, you can look and say that, man, Florida really nailed this hire because, you know, who knows what LSU is going to do as far as kind of pivoting on the next guy. Cause it, again, it did seem like, you know, guys like Jimbo Fisher, right. Lincoln Riley were the guys there. So, you know, Florida's got their guy and that's before the carousel really cranked up, you know, kudos to Scott Strickland again for getting this done quickly, swiftly. And, you know, um, really had that meeting. I believe it was in a, on Tuesday mm -hmm. uh, last week in Louisiana with Napier um, and, you know, again, things just really got done quickly. Wasn't a long drawn out process. You know, I think a lot of Florida fans um, had a little bit of, you know, kind of fear from, you know, how the last coaching change went with, you know, Chip Kelly, you know, and that drama unfolding. And then, you know, Dan Mullen being the guy and there wasn't any drama this time. So that's the kind of coaching change you want to happen. You want things swiftly. You want things, you know, pretty drama free. And, and as far as him as a coach, you know, I can't sit there and say that I know a lot about him X's and O's wise you know, what he does, you know, obviously I need to do a little bit more research on that, but you for me, me being, for me being a recruiting guy, you know, he has a really good name about that. You know, some things I have heard, you know, very organized, which I think is something that Florida has really lacked in the recruiting, you know, aspect for quite a while. Um, and, you know, just reading things, he's just, he's very cut from the same cloth of Nick Saban being from that coaching tree, as far as, you know, really attention to detail, really in love with the process. And that's from all parts of it, you know, not just coaching and, and recruiting, but, you know, from nutrition down to the little details in there. And I think those little details are something again, that Florida has been missing. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see how he continues to fill out the staff, you know, going forward. I think that's a big deal for, you know, any college program is, is filling out that coaching staff, but he seems like a guy that has, a lot of connections just from having stops at Alabama, having stops at Clemson, just being around the, you know, the coaching neighborhood for so long. So I am interested to see how he feels things out. He does seem to kind of have a swagger around him to where a lot of coaches really want to kind of join up with him. I'm not speculating any names or anything like that, but he does seem to have that aura around him that a lot of coaches seem to want to be a part of. And again, Florida is kind of one of those programs that sells itself. A lot of coaches want to be a part of Florida and be part of the SEC. So I think that that really helps well and, and makes that an attractive spot as well. Yeah, I think, you know, he's obviously very, very well respected in coaching circles. And I think one of the things to watch is going to be exactly kind of what you just talked about, you know, the assistant coaches. You know, he has kind of the cachet, I think, to really be able to go out and put together a good staff. And, you know, while I was reaching out to sources kind of throughout this process, that was one of the things that was repeatedly emphasized to me from the Florida side of things was, you know, Billy Napier has really buttoned down when it comes to exactly what he wants to do. And and he's not the only coach that has that kind of like binder uh, plan, sort so to speak, where he takes notes meticulously and can refer back to previous years of, you know, this is how I did it this year. Uh, this is how I would change it if I went forward. I mean, I remember Will Muschamp was a guy that, that kind of came in with that same kind of plan. And, you know, there's been a lot of hires off the Nick Saban tree. And, you know, for various reasons, different ones haven't worked out. I, I don't think you can ever guarantee a coach is going to be a complete slam dunk, right? But sure. Billy Napier has, I think, a lot of the things that not only, you know, make Nick Saban effective, but I think he has some of the things that Florida was really looking for coming off the Dan Mullen era when, quite frankly, just the entire operation from the jump was a little bit disorganized. And I think, I, I think you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? Dan Mullen did a lot of good things at Florida. Um, but if we go back, Blake, to, and I think I mentioned this on yesterday's podcast, which became obsolete very quickly. Even from the start, Dan Mullen had issues in his recruiting department, talking about guys like uh, Otis Yelverton, Cordell Landers. There was a lot of turnover 
in some of those roles where you really need to have a strong staff that has a clear vision. And, and Florida, I think, really botched that at the beginning of the Dan Mullen era. And I don't know if it was overconfidence from Dan Mullen that, you know, his X's and O's coaching would come through, that, that you know, his longtime assistants with their experience would be able to push Florida to, to kind of an elite level past where they got at Mississippi State. But whatever the case, it's clear that Florida needs a little bit better infrastructure vision for the program. And I think Scott Strickland, ever since he arrived in 2016, has really pushed for the infrastructure piece. And I think that's the reason Billy Napier is taking this job. I think that Florida very much in in their conversations with Billy Napier made it clear, hey, you know, you can talk to the previous guys that were at Florida. You can talk to Jim McElwain, who you worked with in 2012 at Colorado State you know, guys that you trust and and figure out from them exactly what went wrong. And a lot of that is going to boil down to recruiting infrastructure, the ability to spend to really grow that recruiting staff and hire guys that really you can pull guys away that are having success from other programs. We'll give you the salary to do that. Um, like one of the things that's interesting is uh, Bob Redman and I have reported this on Swamp 24-7 uh, behind the paywall for our, our subscribers, but I'll say it here now. Billy Napier was kind of, uh, from my understanding, giving a range of salary for for his head coaching position. And, you know, Florida basically said, hey, here's what we're willing to spend. Now, you can decide if you want to take a little bit less salary to build some of this infrastructure in terms of recruiting department and all that. And and my sense is very much that strictly or that Napier isn't so locked in on his own salary that he was, uh, you know, sacrificing any of that right and and that's something that people at ull have reported i know very publicly that he's kind of a team player in that sense where as long as the program's pushing in the right direction he doesn't care if he's making five million or seven million right and we don't have contract figures on him yet uh, i've heard a couple things uh, that have, have reported on the swamp 24 7 message boards for vip subscribers but blake the bottom line is i think you've got a guy that at least has a lot of the qualities of what florida needs to push this thing into the territory of Alabama's, Georgia's, Clemson's, where there is no lack of commitment from the administration. And Napier will walk into a situation where he's got an $85 million facility opening up soon. And I think you can really start to sell the vision. And then, you know, I I think going back to the assistant coaches thing, I think he's going to really be able to hire some high quality assistants. You know, Doug Belk is a a guy that I I know that has kind of been circled on his list. Uh, Knowles, the defensive coordinator at Oklahoma State's another one that, uh, you know, from Oklahoma State sources in our network, he's he's considering and potentially reaching out to. So, Blake, I think at this point, it's all about kind of building that structure forward. And I think a good coach, as I've said before, can come in and establish his vision. And I thought in certain ways, Dan Mullen did that. I thought on the field, from a culture standpoint, that kind of thing, Dan Mullen did a really good job in his first two years but they let the recruiting infrastructure kind of settle and it wasn't very good. And consequently, when you get into year four, you're seeing some of those depth gaps on the depth chart. So like, what does Napier have to do? Obviously he's going to coach the Sunbelt title game now on December 4th. We know that he'll be in Gainesville December 5th. What does he have to do very quickly from a recruiting standpoint to kind of stabilize things? Well, you know, you hit the nail on the head with, with the, you know, the Sunbelt championship game. It doesn't seem like Florida is going to be able to host official visitors that first weekend of December. So that already puts you behind the eight ball because you've got two weekends left of official visitors, um, you know, leading up to that December 15th early signing period on top of, you know, guys that haven't taken the official visit. I know, I think I mentioned on the last podcast, there are guys that have taken official visits in the past to Florida that will be allowed to take another official visit just because of a coaching change. So for me, you know, obviously Sunday start, opened up the uh, first day of the contact period where coaches can go visit recruits, um, whether it's at school or, you know, in home visits or anything like that. Um, Florida started out on Monday uh, hitting the road. I've got a bunch of uh, their stops already up on Swamp 24-7, uh, different articles. I'm going to put together because um, we had to get on the podcast. I didn't have time to, but I'm going to kind of put together a running list just so it's not, you know, getting buried of all the different stops they have. So I'm going to have a running list of that as well. So. You know, they're already got the assistant coaches that are currently there going to visit commits and targets and all those kind of things going forward. Um, But for Napier, um, you know, I talked with Nick Evers, Florida's four star quarterback commit the other day whenever they made this hire official. Um, It sounds like the visit between him and Napier is still being sort of worked out. Tuesday was the day that Evers had mentioned that he believes that Napier will be by. Um, good first stop, you know, your quarterback commit, that's kind of the glue that holds your class together. Um, that's a good first stop for him, but going forward, I think you have to not only 
identify guys that you want to target going forward because, you know, a new coaching staff, it's going to bring new flavor. And as you continue to add different assistant coaches, you're just going to have different perspectives. So, you know, I think you can expect the board to expand, you know, there's going to be some new names that maybe weren't being mentioned before, but I think on top of that too, new guy has to go meet the commits. You know, I think for the most part, that solid nucleus of the class, you know, you've had guys like Isaiah Bond that's decommitted, um, Jamarian Burt who decommitted, but for the most part, the guys that are still in Florida's class still seem very solid. Go see those guys, go introduce yourself, build those bonds there, you know, get them on campus if you need to. All those things, you know, are, are great. But I think you need to look at the guys, you know, guys like four-star safety, Isaiah, Isaiah Thomas, um, you know, plenty of other guys in the state of Louisiana where he has a lot of connections, Napier does. Um, guys like four-star defensive lineman Quincy Wiggins, mm-hmm. uh, four-star running back Trevor Etienne, four-star safety Austin Osbury. I mean, there are a lot of guys in the state of Louisiana that were interested in Florida before this coaching change. I think you kick the tires on those guys because you've got a Louisiana guy. You're from Louisiana, Thomas. You know that those guys all kind of band together, even though that Napier isn't, you know, a Louisiana born and bred type of guy, but he's been there for those years. So there's going to be some common ground where those guys can relate. So I think that's an interesting topic going forward. But what I'm getting at is those guys that were interested in Florida previously, those guys that were already, you know, had Florida down and, you know, maybe top three, top five types of schools, Uh, maybe a guy that, you know, was really interested in Florida, but, you know, we got down to brass tacks. Maybe he didn't click with, you know, Mullen or a consistent coach or something like that. You kick the tires on those guys that you felt good at, you know, excuse me, good on before the coaching change. You see if you can kind of rekindle the flame with any of those guys you work in there. And I say that just because those are where you have to turn to. You have to pivot to where you're going to have some traction already going guys that are already aware of Florida where the last kind of piece of this puzzle is just getting to know the new head coach and building those bonds. And that's easily done on an official visit. So I think at this point, wherever you, going to probably see some new names pop up. I think offensive line is an area where you're going to need to see some new names just because there were very few names before, you know, the coaching change happened, you know, from Mullen to Napier. But I think going after those guys that already had pretty strong interest in Florida, I think is very important. I think that's something that you need to go for now, just because you're already behind the eight ball with just the lack of not having the official visit weekend. So you kind of have to make it easy on yourself, see what you can pull together for that early signing period. Florida was already kind of looking at signing a smaller class as it was. Um, So I think at this point, kind of rush as you can, because you're already going to be behind the eight ball for the early signing period. And then at at the very least, you can always kind of piece things back together, you know, kind of scout things out, piece back the board together as you finish out of that. You know, January is going to be important because there's another signing day in February. Transfer portal, I think, is going to be have to be something that Florida needs to really lean on right now, just because smaller class kind of behind the uh, behind the eight ball, like I said, with just targets out there just because you're missing that that pivotal official visit weekend. So I would say the portal is one that you really need to vet also. Yeah, speaking of the transfer portal, Blake, I know you've been it's looking down at your phone. Today. I'm looking at my phone. We're trying to coordinate with Bob Redman. We've got our second entry from Florida into the transfer portal today that we can confirm. Uh, Gerald Mincy on the offensive line just entered the NCAA transfer portal. So that story will be on Swamp 24-7 shortly. Dante Zanders or Dante Lang uh, was another guy that entered this morning. But uh, Blake, let's take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back talking a little bit more Billy Napier and where this thing needs to go going forward. Welcome back to the Swamp 24-7 podcast. I'm Thomas Goldcamp here with Blake Alderman. Blake, uh, <laughs> I apologize to viewers or listeners uh, for this show. We, uh, you know, we, we meant to shoot yesterday and, and things got crazy as, as news was breaking left and right. Today, we... <laughs> We set out to shoot, uh, we're trying to get it in before an 1130 Sunbelt uh, title game conference call with Billy Napier, so I've got to get on that, so we won't be too long in this second half segment. I just kind of wanted to cover anything we haven't covered, and obviously we'll go more in depth on Billy Napier going forward. Uh, some notes from, from I guess, Brett Diogardi from the team's meeting today. Scott Strickland kind of met with them and, and talked to the guys about how the process unfolded. Did not meet with Billy Napier, he said, until after he had parted ways with Dan Mullen. So he wanted to clear up some of the rumors out there about this kind of being in the works for a few weeks. Um, Blake, my thoughts on the recruiting class, this class, uh, you're just trying to salvage it. It, You're not like, I think realistically, I don't think Florida fans should be expecting this class to suddenly jump into the top 10, even though Billy Napier is regarded as a good recruiter. But I wanted to go back to your point of, you know, guys that Florida may have had on the board earlier that for whatever reason just didn't click with the previous staff may click with this one. I think that's absolutely going to be the case. And I think even going back to what we talked about yesterday on the podcast, we were surprised by the the degree of interest and enthusiasm from the recruits that showed up at that Florida State game. So I don't think it's uh, one of those situations where, you know, 
the class is going to be terrible. I, I think Billy Napier is going to be able to get some guys involved late, like you said, that maybe you know Florida had had kind of run the, run its tires with a little bit earlier in the process for whatever reason, lost traction. Um, it, you talked about a couple of them, but who are the, some of those guys that you think maybe are slightly off the radar right now that could jump back onto it? Uh, you know, I think a lot of, like I mentioned, a lot of Louisiana guys, you know, I mentioned a couple of those guys and I, I did forget to mention one, a five-star Jacoby Matthews, who's a safety out of Louisiana. Um, that's a guy that really did like Florida a lot. A&M looks like the team there. Um, like I said, Azaria Thomas, I think Nigel Lee Kelly is one that you think you would think that Florida has to kick the tires on. Um, you know, I don't know how, how official visits will work with him. I think he's running pretty low on taking them. If he does have one more, um, he may have used it. I know Auburn was the school that he was talking about visiting at one point. Um, and it looks like he actually used it uh, this past weekend. So he's out of official visits. Um, I, you know, he could be one Julian Armella, I think is an interesting name because you didn't see a lot of traction for Florida there. Um, he's a four-star offensive lineman from down at St. Thomas Aquinas has a really good relationship with Corey Bell. Who's in the recruiting office at Florida. Um, who's actually on the trail today. They promoted him to be on the trail. Um, he'll be on the trail this week since they're down some, uh, some, uh, some coaches. Um, but Armella, you know, he's a guy that's retweeted, you know, Napier's farewell. Um, you know, I think that that's one guy that, you know, really wasn't getting any traction with Florida. And I say that because this is a guy that hasn't visited since he was an underclassman. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say he was maybe a freshman or a sophomore. He visited for one, for one of Florida's spring football games. Just really haven't seen a lot going on there. So I think that's one name that you could pay, maybe get a look back at. Um, you know, Wesley Basanti is a, is a four-star linebacker. He's closing in on a commitment date, but it's not like he hasn't moved things back again. Um, he's one that could take another official visit to Florida. It looks like Florida State was kind of trending there. Um, maybe a guy that you can continue to maybe get some some wheels turning back there. Um, you know, Devin Moore, I think, is a name that Florida really is showing a he lot of interest in. They always have. He's committed to Notre Dame, defensive back from down there in Naples. Uh, Bell and uh, Florida's uh, current cornerbacks coach Jules Montanar are visiting him today um, on Monday. So maybe that's a guy that you can shake an official visit out, you know, get him to know the new coaching staff. So, um, you know, there's probably some other names, you know, right now I'm still kind of waiting to see how things play out, you know, just as, you know, you got to figure out who the staff is hiring. It's kind of unfortunate that, you know, Billy Napier, I, it, at least at this point on Monday, I haven't heard of him on the trail for Florida at all. Again, he's planning for a, you know, a conference championship game. So I think you're going to see some scarce visits there. Shamar James is maybe another one. He's a guy that we mentioned that visited visited for the Florida state game. He's a four-star linebacker, former four to commit top 100 type of guy. Uh, Christian Robinson is seeing him on Monday. Um, get him to come back, meet coach Napier. Um, you know, I think that one thing he's keeping to see is, you know, maybe what goes on with Christian Robinson is he, is he here? Is he gone? Um, but he's also got a really good relationship with Chase Clark, who's in Florida's recruiting office as well. So, I um, mean, you know, those are maybe some names just kind of off the top of my head that I think Florida should kind of turn back on just because those are guys that have shown interest, you know, Matthew McCoy, a three-star offensive lineman, just because I feel like names are kind of scarce there on the offensive line for Florida. Uh, three-star offensive lineman from up in Jacksonville. Um, he says he'll still take an official visit to Florida. I don't know that they're really setting visit dates yet. I think things are still kind of up in the air as far as setting up official visit dates, just because you're still figuring it out things. I would think the 10th is probably going to be the biggest weekend because like I said, it, it doesn't look like Florida's going to have any official visitors this weekend with, you know, Napier dealing with the conference championship game and having to be introduced at Florida. And there's just really a lot going on. Uh, Jacobian Nonar is another guy in state, a, a three-star offensive lineman. I actually spoke with him this morning to get his thoughts on the Napier hire. I really didn't know a lot about him, but he said that he looks forward to meeting him because he's going to take an official visit to Florida. There you go. I don't know if he's going to sign early, but that's another guy, too, that, you know, has committed to Maryland, um, was really high on the Florida before. And, you know, I had my crystal ball on Florida um, because it seemed like they were the team to beat. And he kind of pulled a fast one, committed to Maryland. So, you know, those are some of the guys there that I think that, you know, just off the top of my head that Florida really needs to kind of go back and turn the tires on. Isaiah Bond is another one, a former, a former Florida commit. Uh, really speedy slot type of guy. Another guy that has a really good relationship with Corey Bell. I expect Bell to be in to see Bond one day this week. Um, you know, not really wasting a lot of time to see him. So, um, you know, those guys that were former Florida commits that maybe backed off of things early there, um, I think you should kind of kick the tires on them, you know, since they're uncommitted guys like Shamar James, Isaiah Bond, and some of those other guys that I mentioned um, as far as kind of those top targets that have been continuous targets for Florida, guys that they've really still been interested in. All right, Blake, I've got to run to get on a conference call, but one last thing here before we close. What is what are the current assistants do you expect telling these guys not knowing, you know, if they're going to be part of the new staff, um, you know, not not I, like has Billy Napier, do you think, given them a message or has Scott Strickland given them a message to, to kind of preach? Have you heard any of that so far? 
Uh, you know, not a lot, but I know that Jamari Lyons, who's a four-star defensive lineman who is committed to Florida, says that he's kept up with Coach Turner throughout the entire coaching change from the day Mullen was fired uh, till this morning. And that they haven't really said – that's because I don't think a lot of the current assistants know. I think right. at this point they're just trying to kind of go with the flow and see what happens. But Turner's message to Jamari has been – you know, you're a Florida boy. Florida can do a lot of things for you. If I'm here, if I'm not here, just kind of what Florida can do for these guys in general, you know, the high education playing the SEC. You know, if you're a guy that's close to Florida or in Florida, you can still be close to your family. You know, there's going to be a new guy there that's going to be changing a lot of things. There's a lot of things from facilities wise coming into Florida. You know, there's just a lot of things that I think these guys are still preaching that, you know, I don't know if I'm here. I don't know if I'm going to be here. I don't know if I'm not going to be here, but Florida can still be a really good place for you. And I think that's really the only message that those guys can give at this point. All right, Blake. Well, I appreciate all your insight on that. We will obviously have a lot more on Swamp 24-7. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, reiterate our Cyber Monday deal ends at 11.59 p.m. We're offering 75% off to new annual VIP subscribers. You basically get nine months for free, guys. That's a pretty good deal. Uh, like I said, Brett Diogardi, who was on the team from 2016 to 2020, has helped provide us with a lot of back-end insight as far as the locker room, the players, how they're responding. I know that he's working on a piece right now talking to some former players about uh, the shift from Dan Mullen to Billy Napier. Bob Redmond's provided some unique color from behind the scenes in the locker room from Saturday's game uh, before the FSU game. I've been giving you some feedback on where the coaching search has gone, how that kind of played out. And obviously, Blake, we will have plenty of recruiting updates as that early signing period fast approaches. So we encourage you guys to check it out, Swamp 24-7, or you can go to florida.247sports.com. 75% off annual VIP subscriptions until 11.59 p.m. tonight, guys. We hope you all take advantage. That will do it for today's episode of the Swamp 24-7 podcast. Thanks for tuning in.